On behalf of Region 7 in the ASPR Supplemental Grant, we want to invite you to listen to our series of Zoomcasts. These conversations are meant to inform and educate our listeners on the perils and pearls of the lessons we have learned regarding COVID-19 and other special pathogens. We will be having conversations with experts in their field and sharing the information with you. So listen, learn, and enjoy the following Zoomcast. Hi, and welcome to uh, this episode of our Region 7 Zoomcasts. I'm Kate Bolter, Nurse Manager of the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit, and I'm really happy to um, be able to talk to Dr. Daniel Anderson today on long COVID. You know, we're going to get to understand that a little bit better. Um, so, but before we begin, Dr. Anderson, would you mind um, just, you know, giving us a brief introduction on who you are and what you do? Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here as well to talk about this. I think it's a very important thing. Um, I'm, uh, again, Dan Anderson, one of the chief uh, of cardiovascular medicine and with Nebraska Medicine, the co-physician executive leader for our heart and vascular programs. Um, my research interest has been viral cardiomyopathies in my grad school, and I love uh, inflammation of disease. Not that I love disease, but <laughs> really love studying the inflammation that's associated with disease. And that's my research passion. So there's some nice overlap here. So. Nice. So, so we're going to talk about long COVID. And, you know, that, that's a new term that's come out, you know, COVID's a new disease. And um, we had never heard of this before. So can you tell us a little bit about exactly what it is? So I think long COVID is really when we start thinking about after somebody has had a COVID-19 infection, you know, how does that affect us long term? Most people actually recover as best we know without any real sequelae or any real, any real ongoing effects of the infection itself. But what we found is that there are, uh, uh, thankfully, less number of people that do have persistent symptoms that exist beyond kind of the acute infection where you're, you have the fever, you just don't feel well, you know, you start to get better, but then this thing kind of creeps in and people have symptoms, whether it's related to the brain fog or fatigue or heart failure. And so I think that's really what we're thinking about when we think about long COVID. It's this long lasting effect of the viral infection. Yeah, it's, it sounds really scary, you know, when you say, you know, it, it could be something just as simple as brain fog where you, you know, you feel a little tired, but cardiovascular, so heart problems mm -hmm. are being seen with long COVID. Well, I think what we're, what we're really trying to see, starting to see is that this is a virus that it impacts the circulatory system. And, you know, some of the effects of that is areas that are involved can be the brain, it can be the heart. You know, honestly, it can be almost every organ um, what we really miss is when we have injury to the brain and we have injury to the heart, that's a problem we don't like to have. You know, if your if your left big toe gets injured, you're like, eh, you know, <laughs> it's not it's not gonna impact me like brain injury and cardiac injury. So we, we focus on these two because they're they're critical aspects of life. And you know, our cognitive ability is is super important. And I, I think it's a very common problem. It's the organ that's affected. And so even in cardiovascular disease and routine atherosclerosis, we think about heart attack and stroke because the reasons people have heart attack are very much the reasons people have strokes. And I think that overlap exists today. And that's kind of what you're describing. So are, are people dying because of long COVID? So I do think that people have problems with long COVID, cardiovascular disease or CNS disease or other organs that really does shorten their lives. You know, what we don't know is that long-term history or that long-term uh, effect yet, because we're only 18, 24 months, you know, into this disease itself. Yeah. You know, I think if you think in other terms, you know, often we see people come in and they have heart failure and they have heart failure with the, in the absence of coronary artery disease. So they didn't have the classic heart attack but the heart muscle is very much weakened. And we say, oh, you must have had a virus some time ago. And now you have heart failure. You know, you have heart failure on medications. Some have severe heart failure where they end up with a left ventricular assist device and some have transplants. So very similar to what we've seen with other viruses, 
we've just never had a defined onset of a viral infection where we've watched it progress because we actually knew you had a virus infection because we were screening for it. So I, I think that some of this is, is very reminiscent of what we've always dealt with in cardiovascular medicine um, and impacting the heart. I think that the, the, the risk of COVID-19 seems to be greater. Um, we, we're, we worry about the long-term effects may be more common after a COVID infection as compared to the flu or some other virus, which we know can cause heart problems, but it doesn't appear as great as we expect COVID to have. Now, the reality is, is, is you remember my previous statement, it was more along the lines of, oh, you probably had a viral infection. So while somebody has heart failure because of something, we really don't know what it was, when it was, and all of that. So uh, it's something that we've not understood in our research and in our clinical medicine very well. So I think we know it's happening, exactly how much will happen over the next years and five and 10 years. Um, you know, I think it's going to be an important distinction. So I think just because you got the infection and you felt well and you got better um, doesn't guarantee you're out of the woods. Is there any set of our population that's more susceptible to it? You know, is, is it younger people, older people, women, men? So I think there's, there's no part of the population that's excluded from potentially having problems. Okay. What we know is, is that the older you are, and if you have some underlying medical problems, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, history of heart trouble, you're more likely to have more problems with COVID-19. I think that's become quite clear. Why that is, we don't know. If I was going to tell you what I think it is, and we're learning about this and more and more is... I think it has to do with kind of underlying inflammation in the vessels. You know, if I'm right now 58 years old and I don't have any heart problems, but if I have inflammation in my arteries and my vessels, I may not have any trouble until I get to be 63. And then I've had the big heart attack, I've had the stroke, you know, but having inflammation in my vessels for 15, 20, 30 years is a driver of atherosclerosis. I think what we're beginning to understand is that when somebody has COVID-19 and they have these kinds of problems, they probably already have inflammation of the vessels, which puts them at a place where they're susceptible to the effects of COVID-19. If you don't have the inflammation in the vessels, you'll get COVID-19. It'll be mild. It won't be very robust infection. Um, and you may not have long COVID. But if you have inflammation in the vessels, you might have a more likely chance of having severe acute infection and long COVID. Wow. Wow. What, what about children? So I think children, they're less likely to have the inflammation. I think so too, because, you know, what we know is in life, inflammation goes up, you know, and if you're overweight, it goes up faster. If you have high blood pressure, it's even greater, you know, so you start adding all these things on top of it and the inflammation becomes more pronounced. And so if you're five years old and you have normal blood pressure and normal cholesterol and you haven't had 10 decades of insults to your body, you know, because you're, you know, young and fresh, you're probably not going to have the susceptibility to it. But you can have infection if you have underlying medical problems that are genetic or inherited or are, are acquired by other mechanisms that maybe does lend you to have some inflammation you know, we all have little bouts of inflammation in our life. You know, if you get the common cold, you know, we all know that I get sick. What do we do? We stay home. We're exhausted. We're down and out on the couch. That's a whole body event that's all inflammation due to a virus infection. You know, so if those kinds of things keep coming back in life, you know, the damage can add up, which is where you end up in trouble when you're 30, 40, and 50. Um, and maybe it contributes to some underlying general inflammation that makes you susceptible to the next virus of infection, i.e. COVID-19. So I think when you think about what's the severity of disease with COVID, and we know the more severe the disease acutely with COVID is more likely to have long COVID. It's not okay. totally clear yet, but we do think that that exists. So if you had a bad infection up front on the front side, you're more likely to have, you know, Long longstanding COVID. symptoms. Um, you know, and I think that's dependent on two things. It's dependent on the individual, 
and the susceptibility, which we're kind of describing. If there's inflammation, you're more susceptible. And it's also dependent on the load that you get inoculated with. I think those two things clearly play a role in the acuity of the disease and the long-term effects. Are you seeing people who've been vaccinated getting long COVID? Yep. I, th I think yeah. vaccination is spectacular. It's a super important. It's, it's without mm -hmm. a doubt the best thing we've ever done. This is the safest and probably most effective vaccine we've ever developed, you know? So I think, uh, you know, unfortunately there's a lot of opinion, you yeah. know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, fervent belief in what we should, should not do. And, you know, the, the reasons behind what people believe are so varied, it's hard to count them on a hand, you know, and, and I think we, we tend to, I don't know, we lose objectivity compared to what I think about from an evidence-based point of view. Um, you know, so it is a challenge. There's no doubt that it's a challenge, but vaccination is very important because let me just say, I am an individual that has a, a level of susceptibility here. You know, I get a big viral load and I do want to explain that viral load and I've been vaccinated. That's a, a shield of protection that keeps me from developing a severe and acute disease. Yeah. If I take that shield away, and the same situation occurs, I'm going to have a more significant response. So can you get infected after you have vaccination? Absolutely. Is it as bad and as is it as severe? No, it's less. It, it really decreases that. So it is a bit of a shield of protection. It's not perfect. And, and I use the example, um, you know, in some of our research studies, we studied a virus called Coxsackie virus. It's a, a virus, ironically, identified from Coxsackie, New York, causes heart disease, causes acute myocardial damage, and people died from it. You know, it's a pretty significant virus. You know, so there's a susceptibility some people have to this virus, but not everybody gets it and not everybody has problems that we know of. But if, if you get a big dose of the virus, you know, you have the increased risk of, even if you're not susceptible, having significant disease. So that virus dose is again, important. So it's again, patient susceptibility and virus dose. And I, and I use the analogy, um, you know, if you're, if you're sitting in a confined room with somebody who's shedding a lot of virus and you spend two or three hours talking to them and you inhale two or three hours right. of viral particles, you're off to the races. If you're wearing a mask and you walk past them at lows, very small dose you just inhaled. That's what a viral load is. How much did you get inoculated with? Right. That susceptibility in that inoculum, super important in understanding why people have some disease, some don't, and some could develop long, long COVID. So I hope that kind of makes a little bit of sense in that regard. It, it, it does. It, it, it really does. You know, it's, it's like if you get inoculated with a small dose, your immune system's more likely to be able to fight it off. Yes. But if you get this big dose, you know, it's onslaught, yeah, yeah, your immune system is overwhelmed. But if you have the vaccine on board, that's going to assist your immune system to, yes. to fight it off. So I, I suppose, you know, people who are thinking, well, you know, some people get mild COVID, and uh, I want to take my chances. And, and that's where I'm going to go. They're, they're really putting their lives at risk, you know, and when you think about what could happen with long COVID afterwards. Yeah. Yep, yep. It's kind of like wearing your seatbelt, you know? Yeah. So if I don't want to wear my seatbelt and I never drive, nah, no big deal, you know? So if I, want, I don't want to wear my seatbelt and I drive and putter around town at 20 mile an hour, well, nah, probably not a big deal. Yeah. But if I'm trying to drive where my car, or not wear my seatbelt, and I'm driving my Ferrari 250 mile an hour down the highway, you know, the risk of me having injury is pretty high. So similar things, you put yourself at risk by not wearing a seatbelt. You do things that expose you to a high level of risk. And if, and if all the events line up, the catastrophe is greater. Right. You know, you're, so it's you're, a yeah, you're fine until you have that accident. Yeah, you're okay driving uh -huh. a Lamborghini 200 mile an hour, <laughs> you know, yeah, until you have an accident. And then you're, you know, launched out through the windshield and your head's not what it used to be anymore. And you become a cardiac don donor. Uh -huh. Wow. So, so how would, how would a person recognize that they've got long COVID or, or post COVID syndrome? So I, I really think for me, probably the best example is, is some change in functionality. 
You know, I think the mental fog is a good description, mm-hmm. you know, because of people's like, you know, I just don't have the memory. I can't think as well as I used to. I mean, that's brain damage, yeah. you know? So I think, do you recover from it? Most people probably do because the brain is pretty amazing, you know, at recovering at times. But again, you know, brain tissue is something you get once in your life. And if you, and if you destroy it, you're not left with anything at the end of that. So I think avoiding anything that would cause brain damage, you know, or cardiac damage, you know, is an important thing to do in kind of all of our discussion here. So, so I think if you said, you know, hey, I, I felt like, you know, if I use myself as the example, you know, I'm somebody who likes to do, uh, you know, moderate amount of exercise. I love riding a bike. You know, but after I get uh, COVID, you know, I'm just weak, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I can't ride my bike. You know, a month ago, I was riding 20, 30 miles a day on yeah. Saturday, and now I can hardly go up a hill in the, in the neighborhood. You know, that's the effects of the virus. You know, that's the effects of one being sick and ill and down and out for a week or two. But then the potential that it damaged the blood vessels and maybe even some of the tissues so that I can't do what I used to do. And so that long COVID is symptoms that have developed because of the infection that don't resolve. That's really how we're describing long COVID. Again, be it weakness in the legs or or loss of taste and smell that never comes back. I have people who can't taste and smell and it's been two years. Can you imagine not tasting anything for the rest of your life? No, that that's, I mean that's a quality of life. That is thing totally. to be able to eat and I mean you taste can go eat everywhere and not know it's mm-hmm. terrible. Right. <laughs> yeah, you'd definitely lose weight, maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so if if a person um, gets COVID and and they recover from COVID, but they're still that little bit tired, or there's there's something different about them, what should they do? So I do think you know we we would treat the symptoms as much as we would do anything else. Cause I think once the injury is done, you know, you want to make sure you're not missing something. I do. I, I do think for me, you know, if somebody has a pretty significant and severe episode of COVID, I want to also think I'm going to go back and go to the original question. You know, people are at risk for this because they have underlying medical problems. They either didn't recognize at the time they had it or um, you know, wasn't being treated and managed. So if vascular inflammation is one of these kind of susceptibility aspects, yeah. makes you susceptible. I think if you've had COVID and you got better, but it just never got back to where your norm was, I one begin to say, okay, how do I make sure I kind of get my strength back? You know, there's, I think there's a good routine to say physical therapy, exercise, exercise conditioning, get the most out of what you have so that you can do the most you can in life. But also, step back a little bit further and say, okay, why was I the one that got sick? Did I get a big viral load? You know, I mean, I'll be quite straightforward. My girls are, you know, uh, dating boys. They're at university. You know, so if you, if you spend the evening kissing a boyfriend who's (laughs) shedding virus, you're going to get a whop of an infection, you know? And I think you have to say, did I, did that happen to me? Or was there something else going on, you know, or, you know, uh, is, do I have some underlying inflammation? Maybe I have underlying inflammation, in my vascular tissue that I didn't recognize. I mean, we know people with rheumatoid arthritis are more at risk. We know people who have unrecognized atherosclerosis are at risk, who have hypertension that's at risk. You know, so I make sure we answer those questions is, uh, are, am I down this pathway of, if I don't do anything, I'm gonna have a heart attack again in 10 years or, or a heart attack in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely very frightening. So, that, you know, I'm, I'm suspecting that maybe there's a few people in our communities that don't even know that they've got long COVID and then one day they're going to get hit with, you know, um, you know, maybe a heart attack or, or, or maybe they'll become diabetic because their pancreas was attacked. Yeah, I, I do think that's possible. I mean, I think we have to remember that people have had heart attacks and developed diabetes well before COVID. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think the other thing we have to make sure is, you know, is like, oh, I must have had COVID, therefore I got older. Right. My hair turned gray, my hair fell out, you know, and yeah. I gained weight. Well, welcome to getting older, mm-hmm. you know, so I don't, I, I do make sure we want, we do want to make sure we understand what's related to COVID and is really truly a long COVID. Um, you know, I don't think we should be, you know, well, you know, I just didn't feel well. And then, you know, I, I had a, a, 
you know, some kind of problem. Oh, it must have been COVID. Right. Because it may not be, you know, it might be that you paid attention and you recognize you had a problem. Wasn't necessarily related to COVID. It's worth identifying, trying to address, Mm -hmm. uh, but be cautious about cause and effect versus association. I I often kind of half-heartedly joke with my patients that, you know, I make the sunrise. Like, what? And I said, every day I get up and after I get up, the sun rises. I'm pretty sure I make the sunrise. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. But I thought it was me. Oh, but it's both <laughs> yeah. of us. Yeah, we do it together. There you go. But, but it, you get how silly right. that is. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of the same thing. I had COVID and then I had this problem. We have to make sure we understand we're not just blaming it on COVID, but understand why do you have this problem? Because it'd be terrible for somebody to yeah. say, I had COVID and then I have memory problems. Come to find out they have atrial fib. And they're having strokes. And if yeah. you don't recognize that something else is causing the strokes, they have more strokes and they have more strokes and they have more strokes. And we could have prevented all those subsequent things. So I think we have to be very cautious about, bl- about blaming COVID because we might ignore something that's really going to cause another problem. Yeah. Yeah, but it is a, it's a real syndrome. So uh, Dr. Anderson, before we say goodbye, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think would be important to convey? I think, you know, I think the thing that uh, that's also hugely important to understand is we've talked a little bit about how you get it, why you get it, why it can be mild, maybe reasons it's severe, making sure we recognize and understand if there's underlying risk factors that we should identify so we treat and prevent other problems. Um, I think understanding the value of the vaccine far outweighs the risk of the yeah. vaccine. You know, the risk of having problems with the vaccine is probably seven out of 10,000. You know, yeah. that's, that's, that's the risk of the myocarditis with the vaccine. The risk of myocarditis just because we're alive is one to two out of 10,000. You know, so the vaccine has a, a very low risk, you know, compared to the benefit we've already discussed right. about protecting you. So I think that's an important thing to consider, um, you know, and make sure we remember that. The, the approach and the strategy we're using to prevent COVID and, and, and long COVID on top of that uh-huh. um, is very sound in evidence and being shown more and more that it's beneficial. So, uh, you know, I, I do think there's the, some of the difficulty in having individuals who don't understand, as we all didn't understand, the research, how this happens, you know, yeah. the concerns led to a lot of mistrust because the information changed minute by minute. I mean, it was, uh-huh. it was very difficult to keep up on what we were learning. I mean, we started out with no information and we have w- learned more in the past 18 months about viruses and heart disease and, and infection of the body through this pandemic that it's impressive amount of data that we've learned. We have to be cautious of that data um, you know, as we learn more and more, we find, yes, this is true, but not exactly this way. It's more this way. And in this situation, that's biology. Yeah. So, you know, there's been some dis- people who don't understand that to the great detail and their faith in the, the, the truth of science is a little bit shaken. You know, so I think we have to be cautious with that and educate our patients and people we work with, you know, that this has just been a, a rapid accelerated process of learning that's impressive also overwhelming. It is. Yeah. I, 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 I know. I, I mean, I see new things all the time that we're learning about COVID and mm-hmm. its effects. It's incredible. Well, well, I want to thank you so much um, mm-hmm. for joining me and having this conversation. And, you know, I, I hope that, you know, people will listen and take it to heart and uh, yeah. Yeah. We definitely suggest getting that vaccine to help prevent long COVID. Yep. Prevent COVID and long COVID. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Anderson. And, it is a true uh, pleasure. It's been fun to visit. And any other questions, happy to talk again. Great. Yeah, we just might contact you very soon. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. 
Welcome back to Region 7 uh, Zoomcasts. Uh, I'm Kate Bolter. I'm the nurse manager for the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. Um, we just had a great conversation with Dr. Anderson about long COVID, and uh, we really got his perspective on uh, a, a lot of the cardiovascular side effects and, you know, the uh, inflammatory side of long COVID. Um, and now I'm about to speak with Dr. Uh, Carrie Horty. Um, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell you what she does. But she has a, a, a bit of a different perspective on long COVID. So uh, Dr. Horty, would you mind introducing yourself? And Yes. Hi. As, as stated, I'm Carrie Horty. I'm practicing internal medicine at the Durham Outpatient Center. And I'm participating in the um, post-COVID recovery clinic with Dr. Andy Basie and Eamon Maloney. So we're the three primary care physicians who are seeing uh, some of the patients that have long COVID. Um, and it's been very educational. We collaborate with cardiology, neurology, um, pulmonology, infectious disease, and share ideas and, and best practices. Although with long COVID and COVID in general being so new, everything's changing. So we're kind of... Um, figuring out best practices as we go along and as the evidence uh, makes itself known. Gosh. So, so to hear that, you know, we, we have a clinic set up specifically for post COVID or long COVID um, that, that means this must be quite a big problem. It is a big problem. Um, and it's difficult to diagnose we are seeing patients who have a prior diagnosis of COVID and we will see people months to, uh, now it's getting into a year after their diagnosis of COVID where they still have lingering symptoms, whether it be brain fog or pulmonary symptoms of shortness of breath, chest pain, um, fast heart rate, uh, weakness, muscle weakness, so yeah, these symptoms can really linger quite some time after the initial diagnosis of COVID. So, so do you think, is it like, um, is it damage to those organs that, that's happened because of COVID or do they have some kind of a lingering infection that's causing this? Well, I think the infection has resolved itself, but as Dr. Anderson said, with the immune complexes, there may be deposition in the arteries, in the, in the organs. And again, I wish I could be more straightforward with the etiology or the reason for uh, all these symptoms in post-COVID patients or long COVID patients, but the reason is still not known. We have seen this in other um, disease processes, such as Epstein-Barr virus and Lyme disease, where people have really lingering long-term effects from their initial infection. And it could be from the immune complex deposition. Really, I think we, we don't exactly know, um, but, and there's a wide presentation. You know, Some people just have a lingering cough or shortness of breath. Some people really have such difficulty with cognition. Everyone's symptoms are so unique to them. So, so what, what sort of symptoms are we seeing? You know, you've mentioned, you know, brain fog and chest pain and things like that. What, what are the most common things you see? You know, we see a lot of uh, a symptom, or excuse me, uh, a syndrome called POTS, which is postural orthostatic and tachycardia syndrome. So that means when people stand up, their blood pressure drops and their heart rate races. So we see a lot of that. We see, like I said, a lot of brain fog, a lot of muscle aches and pains, chronic fatigue syndrome, people have a constellation of neurologic symptoms. I've seen patients with numbness um, or weakness in certain limbs, um, chronic pain, which may be from being more sedentary. Those are the main symptoms. Um, we've seen some with rashes, but that doesn't seem to, be, to, to go into the long COVID. That's more acute. Um, but the cardiopulmonary shortness of breath, cough, chronic fatigue wow. are, are the main symptoms we're seeing. Is there, you know, I, I did read you know, not long ago that um, we're seeing an uptick in diabetes in children, type one. Is that something that you're seeing as well? Well, I am, I trained in internal medicine and pediatrics and geriatrics. 
but in my clinic, I'm just seeing adults. So I'm not actually seeing that. Um, so I, I guess I can't comment on that in particular. Okay. You know, um, as Dr. Anderson likely mentioned, the more comorbidities a person has, or the more ill a person gets initially, um, will have a, a more negative long-term effect. But the patients I'm seeing really are previously healthy individuals who the people who come to mind are people who really worked out regularly, who got up and went to work five days a week. Um, and, and are really, some of these patients are really having a difficult time with cognition at work and with having the energy to last a full day at work. So while people who are multimorbid, whether it be obesity or diabetes or underlying heart and lung disease, um, are more at risk for a negative short and long-term uh, effects of COVID, we do see young, healthy people who have devastating courses, wh whether that mean less likely to die, but uh, in some cases do have difficulty with continuing with gainful employment because of the effects of COVID. Do, do you feel like there's a link between the severity of the COVID that they get? and getting the long COVID? In general, for the most part, yes. So I think in general, the more ill you were or with your, with your initial course of COVID, the longer it may be to recover. But the people that I'm seeing in the outpatient internal medicine clinic uh, are individuals who were never on oxygen, were never hospitalized, were not even sick enough to get the monoclonal antibodies because they had no underlying mm -hmm. conditions. And some of these young individuals, young adults, still have severe long COVID symptoms. Well, that, that, that's, um, that's definitely something to think about, you know, what, what the future can hold as far as in healthcare. You know, we're going to have a, a lot of people that are going to have this post COVID syndrome. Absolutely. So, so if, if you got COVID, um, how soon would you know that you've got some kind of lingering effects of it? Some individuals feel like they're just taking longer to get better, but we're waiting about three months before we say it's actually long COVID and mm. start and start calling it that. Um, and it's just not getting back to your baseline uh, uh, function. Um, and that's, that's when we start kind of calling it co long COVID. And long COVID, like I said, it's so amorphous because there's so many different manifestations of the long lingering effects of COVID. Um, it's oftentimes we do blood work and rule out other things such as low thyroid or anemia wow. or B12 deficiency, all the other things that cause muscle aches and pains and cognitive uh, difficulties. And we do pulmonary function tests. And um, so we do rule out other, uh, other causes. underlying conditions, but then in the end, a lot of times we're left with, well, you had COVID and you have not been the same since then. So do people recover from long COVID? Are you seeing that yet? Or is it still too early? I, I have a couple patients, very interestingly, who got the vaccine and they felt that the curtain lifted of their symptoms with each vaccine, with the initial vaccine. And then with the second, whether it be the Moderna one and two uh, doses right. or, or Pfizer. Uh, so I have had a couple patients feel that they get back to normal, get back to work, get back to teaching yoga. Um, and interestingly, anecdotally for me, it's the patients who choose to get the vaccine. Some so of these they got the vaccine after COVID or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then um, felt that their symptoms improved. Um, now, some individuals who have long COVID are very fearful to get the vaccine uh, for fear of those symptoms getting worse. But I have not seen that actually occur. I understand the fear because of how bad right. of a COVID uh, course they had, but I have not seen that manifest itself as their symptoms getting worse after immunization. So, so, so you know, now that, you know, we've got on the subject of vaccines, are we seeing people that 
um, have been vaccinated, maybe have gotten a breakthrough COVID infection, are they getting long COVID? I, I have not seen patients who've gotten vaccine have long COVID. I've only seen individuals who did not have the vaccine in the long wow. COVID clinic. Wow. So, so, you know, to prevent yourself getting long COVID it would be to get vaccinated. Yes. I mean, we know that it decreases the severity of the acute illness, but it also decreases the likelihood of the long COVID symptoms as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it sounds like, you know, long COVID is very debilitating. You know, you're saying people aren't able to work full days, even if there are any not even getting back to work. Yeah, I mean, some of these individuals, we're still working with physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy with the cognition. We're treating some of them similar to post-stroke patients with really learning how to function. It's interesting using kind of the chronic fatigue model in order to resume physical activity, because if you have a person who used to teach yoga or Zumba or something like that, wanting to get back into physical activity and even a little bit of physical activity can set them back physically um, with chronic fatigue weeks. So it's a very slow incremental increase in physical activity over time. And and we encourage them not to push it almost similar to like a post concussive, you know, we reintroduce individuals into activity very slowly over weeks. Um, and then if you have the prior symptoms, you go back to the previous level of engagement and activity. So we're, we're needing to reintroduce some of these individuals back into their prior level of activity very slowly. Wow. Wow. This is incredible. I, I, you know, like I said in the beginning, I think that just the fact that, you know, we've set up a clinic to specifically deal with long COVID is a testament to say, you know, this is a real thing and this is very serious. It is very serious. I think young, healthy individuals or even um, individuals in their 60s and 70s who feel that they don't have many underlying conditions and feel that um, they would be able to tolerate a mild case of COVID. For me, it's very difficult just because I do see these healthy individuals in long COVID clinic and I see the impact it's had on both themselves and their families, Mm -hmm. their ability to have gainful employment. and participate in society. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's devastating for, it's not a large group. Uh, it's not a huge percentage of the population or even the population of people who have COVID, but it, it's pretty devastating. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah, it would be very devastating to me to, you know, I, I don't want to get long COVID and, you know, it'd be devastating for any of my children to get it, you know, it, it would hurt me if, to see them that way as well. Absolutely. And, you know, something that could be prevented just by getting the vaccine. But, well, well, Dr. Horty, I mean, it's been a pleasure. I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Um, is there anything else that, you know, I didn't ask you that you feel that you would want to convey to people about long COVID? Well, for primary care physicians, it's important for us to recognize it as an entity and validate individuals. Individuals just express so much gratitude for the diagnosis and for being able to call it something and move in a forward direction. And I'm working closely with different, you know, with schools and communities that I'm involved in and with making decisions regarding COVID. I think sometimes we have to choose between health and safety and people's um, rights to choose. And so I find that we're having to choose between rights and putting the health and safety of individuals first. I, I, I don't think we can always have both. And doing the right thing for the most good is not a new thing for, for us in this society. So I think putting the common good above as the, as the priority uh, will lead us in the right direction. Yes, absolutely. So, well, I am going to say goodbye now and thank you again. And um, I look forward to maybe hearing more from you in the future when we learn more about long COVID. Thank you so much. Thank you.